Hi, it's my community friends. We are finishing up our summer series with an extra special episode before we shift back into regular content again next week. In this episode, I'm excited to share with you a brilliant conversation I had with Lara Allen and Ashok Das. Lara and Ashok are the event chairs for the upcoming Royal Academy of Engineering's Frontiers event on smart communities which will focus on interdisciplinary research to address global development challenges. This event will focus on low-tech solutions and innovation, as well as bottom-up, context-specific approaches that can be used to improve the lives of the most underserved, mainly rural, communities in developing countries. The theme will also touch on the unintended consequences of some of those solutions in communities. I'm excited to be involved in this event delivering the keynote speech. You can head over to www.raeng.org.uk forward slash frontiers for more information on future opportunities. Now back to Lara and Ashok. Lara is the CEO of the Centre for Global Equality, a Cambridge-based civil society organisation that enables the evolution of innovative solutions to global challenges through inclusive innovation. She's also an affiliate lecturer in inclusive innovation at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. Ashok is the founder and CEO of Sun Moksha, a clean technologies company working on the socio-economic development of rural communities. He has over 25 experience in the semiconductor equipment space in the Bay Area in the USA and clean technologies in Bangalore in India. He has a decade in developing and implementing state-of-the-art solutions for microgrids and irrigation to develop smart villages. In this episode, Lara and Ashok tell us about their backgrounds in academics and engineering respectively, and their shared passion for bridging divides and closing gaps in rural and underserved communities. Lara explains what inclusive innovation and appropriate technology are and why they matter for the empowerment of smart communities. And Ashok tells us about some of the challenges he faced in creating smart communities in rural India. We talk about why it's important to focus on rural and underserved communities and the power of long-term interventions that take more than just one generation to see results, as well as the role of entrepreneurship in research for international development. Lara Ashuk and I discuss why interdisciplinary research is so important in the area of smart communities and the biggest mistakes that engineers often make when approaching these projects. We finish our chat discussing advice for young professionals wanting to get into the space. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Well, hello, Lara and Ashok. It's so great to be here with you tonight where I am, but I think it's morning um, where you both are, um, which is super exciting um, to talk to you from the other side of the world. Now, we're just going to dive straight in here. And Lara, can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? Well, um, a long time ago, I used to be an academic working in South Africa, and I was involved in a community outreach project. and. I became, it, it was a, a project um, in a very rural part of South Africa, and I became enormously frustrated with two things that I think are very relevant to, to this event. The one is that I was very frustrated by the gap between the knowledge and the technical expertise of students that I was working with and rural communities. And there were so many things that the students knew that the communities could use if they could just possibly share it. And then I was also terribly frustrated, or not frustrated, but it took a while for the whole program that we were running was to get students to understand the remarkable 
innovative thinking and knowledge that the local communities had. So I became passionate about the gap and the inability, well, that, that it's so difficult to cross that back gap and what we now call co-creation. So that was 15 years ago now. So now I have the opportunity to work on that gap and on co-creating across through that gap um, based in Cambridge in the UK and working in countries across the world, actually. So that was my background and how I came to be where I am now. That's so exciting. And it sounds like you're really passionate about bridging that gap, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Ashok, how about you? Tell us about your background and what you're passionate about. Well, uh, I'm an engineer, right, as they say. So after graduating from IIT Kanpur, I went to US, did my PhD, worked there for in the Silicon Valley for about a decade in the semiconductor industry. So I have been mostly in the high-tech industry. And then I came back to India to, uh, you know, to set up another company, India operation, again in semiconductor. But then at, uh, you know, I used to usually visit my hometown and, uh, and I also met a couple of others, you know, who were working in the energy sector. So, but after two and a half to three years in India, in semiconductor, I quit and went into renewable energy. And uh, my goal was that let's uh, bridge the gap of the renewable energy that is there in India. And when I went home, I realized that, uh, you know, my family, my friends, all of them are in the same situation of energy access. And uh, one of my niece even told me that, you know, uncle, I have everything. Just give me light. So that is something that, you know, really touched me. And I said, you know, we need to look at what the rural India is, where I come from. I hail from the rural, that same rural India. And uh, since then, I have been working primarily and uh, focused on energy access and energy access for empowerment. So it's not just light, it's the power that is important. So power is for empowerment. And how will be used to generate livelihood in the rural India? Because it's not only energy access, it's the actually the progress, it's the economic development which is important. And uh, that is where my focus is. And in fact, this conference uh, touches upon all the three components that I have started implementing in the villages, which is engineering, that is infrastructure. So set up uh, the solar power plants like the one you see in the background, whether it is solar, biomass, biogas, doesn't matter. It should be a, a renewable hybrid energy in the village. And the second component, livelihood. So whatever we do, we do it for livelihood. Mm. Everybody, you know, yeah. we do not focus too much on light. We focus a lot on livelihood. And the third component is the the smartness, the community, the digital divide. So everywhere we have gone, we have set up IoT, cloud. It's All my solutions are smart microgrid, smart irrigation, driven by IoT, driven by data, uh, you know, data collection, data access to the villages. And that helps me serve these uh, um, these installations and serve these services remotely because most of the time I work in remote villages. Yeah, like I was going to add there that the, the passion for you as well is bridging that gap, another gap. Um, you know, we're talking about that divide that you were talking about just there of having access, but it's not just energy, it's, you know, the power for empowerment. And it's, I think really exciting and really exciting about the conference that you're both uh, chairs at, which is super exciting as well. And I'm so excited to be involved. Now, you gave us a little bit of background of yourself as well as your company. I will just jump back to Lara and maybe you can just tell us a little brief intro of uh, who you work for as well and what you, what you do in the space. So I'm now the CEO for the Centre for Global Equality, which is a not-for-profit based in Cambridge in the UK. We are, you know, our, our roots are in, we, 
we were basically, we are Cambridge's International Development Network. Um, so we have that basis in networking, working together, collaborating. But we now focus very specifically on what we call inclusive innovation, which our byline is innovation for, with and by the rising billions. But basically what we do is we find and generate really cutting edge science and technology, of course, very strongly with the University of Cambridge, probably about 80% of what we do is with University of Cambridge people, but not exclusively. We also work with other UK universities and universities elsewhere in the world. So the idea is to take you know, what are the latest ideas that are really cutting edge frontier technology and we help people to work with people in developing countries and that's with local academics and innovators but also right down to working with farms on the ground in rural areas to take the opportunity of that science and shape it so that it does really address the issues and the challenges that those communities face so that's the it's for those people but it can only work if it's by and with them everything in the end comes down to the process of co-creation so i'd like to stick with you and let's let's go to what is a smart community you know we're talking about smart communities you know smart city is a term that you know we often talk about what is a smart community to you ah so I, I think I probably have a, a quite a broad view of what the smart community is. I've uh, chosen to interpret the, the phrase to be not just digital, but a community that uses advanced technology or high technology and integrates that into their lives. So th there is usually a digital component to that. But, you know, if, if the technology was biotech or something else like that, I wouldn't say no. For me, a smart community is about how you take the latest, greatest, most interesting, most advanced science and technology and use it in those situations. However, so I haven't ringing in my head the, all, the whole debate around appropriate technology. So the idea of don't take something really advanced and dump it in a community when they can't fix it and can't use it and all of that sort of thing. So. I, what we work with at the Centre for Global Quality in this whole inclusive innovation approach is to ask, how can we integrate appropriate advanced technology? So taking all of the principles and practices of appropriate technology and all that commitment to the local and to empowerment, but to use the latest tech. And that's possible now in a way that it wasn't possible in the 70s, partially because of the communications revolution, but also because so many young people from those villages have actually gone to good schools and have gone to university and have become engineers. And actually, so the, the capacity in those villages, often sadly, they're unemployed, so they've gone back to their home village. So now, 50 years after appropriate technology was evolved, you actually do have engineers very often, more often than you would think, in those villages. And they actually do have the capacity to fix an advanced pump with digital aspect to it. So I think we need to move into the 20th century, keep all of those principles, but, but acknowledge uh, the, the capacity that now exists in those villages. And it's very exciting what you can do when you... Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that appropriate technology and then just pinpointing that fact or highlighting the fact that now, you know, we've got engineers in these villages, um, local engineers, local knowledge, and that really, you know, high level of education and or even just specialization in certain technologies and that type of thing. That's something that we definitely need to harness um, as we move forward into this space for sure. Yeah. It's an amazing resource. We should be using it. Mm. Yeah. I reckon you'd experience some of that too in when you're out in those rural villages do you talk to many engineers out in the regional areas our issue is very different uh, most of the engineers you know that they don't get education in the rural areas and they move to the urban areas and then it is very hard to for us to get back get them back to the village so yeah. that was one of the main challenges that I faced in creating this smart community. Right? For me, smart community is 
a locally empowered community that can take care of the needs and the utilization of the infrastructure, yet be digitally smart and digitally connected to the outside world. So that is how we, uh, you know, we implement. So for me, you know, there are two ways to do things. One is that either you bring the capacity of the locals to the level of the technology, or you bring the technology to the level of the people. The first one is much more difficult because you need a lot of training, a lot of education to be done. So we really worked on getting the second one, that bring the technology to the level that the locals can use it. Uh, most of my operators don't even have a degree. They don't, you know, most of them are just high school pass, but they can run these technologies. They can be operative in their environment, in their place, without leaving the village and take care of it. And we have the remote monitoring and digital technologies that helps us identify problems, solve the problems, help them out. We train them. So we do educate them, but we educate them, we train them on the requirement that we have for running this system infrastructure or if they need to go and start some new business, if they want to do some micro enterprises. So we go and train them on those micro enterprises so that they can be productive as soon as, you know, at the minimum effort. So that is where, uh, you know, our entire effort goes to. And so engineering team is our team, mostly yeah. outsiders. I think that really highlights that this isn't a one size fits all. Like it's, it's definitely like each situation, each smart community, we can call them smart communities, but they're not all the same. They're going to require different people involved and different levels of, you know, technology and, and, you know, all sorts of things. And I think, you know, even just this conversation here really highlights how it's, it can't be a one size fits all approach and that we do really have to look at mm -hmm. what, who we're working with and what communities um, need and want. So let's move on. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, but why is the focus on rural or underserved communities so important to you both? Um, we'll start with you, Ashok. If you look at the sustainable development goals, uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all these are focused around poverty, hunger, education, food, health, water, even up to seven, energy, right? What do we realize that uh, in order to solve these problems, I think we need to focus more on eight, SDG eight. If I focus on SDG eight, which makes them economically prosper, it makes them economically move up the value chain. People can take care of hunger, poverty, education, health, you know, why you are, you and I are not worried about it because we are economically sound that we can take care of these needs. So we believe that we should focus on teaching how to fish rather than giving them fish. And our effort has been primarily in that direction that we go work with the community, enable them, empower them, and then say, now you can take care of yourself. Now, we will handhold you as long as it is needed, but eventually it has to be empowered. The locals have to be empowered to make decisions. I don't decide who will get how much power. You decide how you want to distribute the limited power you have, whether you want, like the community makes a decision whether daytime, daytime they will use the power for irrigation and not for homes, right? Because there is a limited amount of power. So these decisions not, we don't do. We enable it. We make sure that whatever decision they take, we implement and enable, uh, empower them to make those decisions. So that is where, and the rural is needed because, you know, if we do not focus on these, this gap, socioeconomic gap will stay where it has been. You know, we have talked about removing poverty from the earth for many, many years, but we still have, you know, same amount of poverty. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we need to focus on something that enables them, that empowers them, and not something that you just give out doles and 
move on. So that is a very short term um, intervention in the long term. And most of the time, we, I also believe that the interventions that we make, the results will not be in one generation. It's a generational impact mm. because if I enable the villagers today, they start to invest on their next generation by education, by feeding them well, by making sure they are healthy, and the next generation finally goes and goes into the second layer of economic development. So, you know, what the impact has to be generational. There is no short-term solution. Mm. So, Laura. How about you? Why is the focus that you have on the rural underserved communities so important? Well, because they're underserved. <laughs> I mean, basically, less work has been done on those those communities. More needs to be done. So, in a sense, for engineers or for development people, there's more exciting things to be tackled because they just haven't haven't been done before. And if you do tackle them effectively and make a difference, then you can really make a difference at scale. So, so I just think it's more exciting because there's more, there are more interesting, difficult questions. And of course, we know engineers love difficult questions. They love to be told, oh, no one else has been able to do this. There's plenty of those sorts of questions. And, it, you know, that just comes down to the, in engineering terms, you could talk about the design constraints are, are very particular. And if you take those design constraints, which come from being rural, being poverty, being cut off from other infrastructure, and really think about how you can solve them, then you've got some really interesting questions. And of course, that's also what researchers are looking for, the good questions that the other people haven't focused on. So mm. it's worth working on it because it's the most exciting thing to do. And if you get it right, you can affect huge amounts of people. Yeah, and I think that transformational change Something I often talk about in this like smart city, smart community space. It's like, you know, lots of people talking about cities. It's all happening in the cities and, and that's great. And, you know, when we talk about a lot of, you know, maybe transport solutions, it's very city focused. And, you know, now we've improved, you know, moving around the city, which is great. It helps people. But yeah, I'm also very interested in regional areas in Australia and overseas that, those, that are underserved. Yes, we should focus on them because they're underserved, but there's so much potential for that real transformational change. And like um, Ashok, you were talking about that generational change, which, yes, also gets me really excited. So, yeah, no, there's such great things there. And um, thanks so much for sharing that for both of you. Now, the next question is about entrepreneurship. So what is the role of entrepreneurship in research for international development? Um, Lara, how about we start with you? Well, so research on itself, there isn't really direct connection between entrepreneurship and research. But I think that if you want your research to make a difference, if you want it to become real in the world, there are basically two routes. One is policy and the other is it gets integrated in some way into the our economy. So either a big company can pick it up, but in the case of this kind of work, big companies at the moment are less interested in rural communities because they're not seen as massively important markets. I think big companies are wrong about that, but never mind, we won't tell them. Um, <laughs> so really, the entrepreneurship is absolutely key in bringing new disruptive advanced technologies into these markets because it's the young, new entrepreneurs that are interested in opening that market up, creating something for those people, for that, for those end users and turning them into something that's economically sound. And I'm, I'm sure Ashok will talk about this, but I completely agree with Ashok in terms of everything needs to come back to livelihoods or, or work or however you want to talk about it, but bringing income into those households. Because if you bring income into those households, then they have the choice to spend it whatever they need to do, whether it's health or education. So entrepreneurship in terms of startups that make something that can maybe be sold to those end users, but also micro entrepreneurship in the villages. And if those two things can be connected, then then I think you've really got a winner. Mm -hmm. So to encapsulate that, I think entrepreneurship is probably the key way that 
research in this area is actually going to be used. It's like the action, it's like the mechanism for action. The way to ha- make it happen in the world, mm. I think. Ashok, how about you? What, what are your thoughts on this? If you look at historically, every new development, research, innovation done has been spread to the masses through entrepreneurial activities. So entrepreneurs have been a key component in bringing R&D to reality. Mm -hmm. And that is where, you know, I would say that I am one of those guys, right, who has, uh, but what we did, we have also driven the other way. You know, usually people say that, you know, you do R&D first, you look at this and then go and see what the uh, applications are. I hit the ground first. Uh, We went to the villages first. We went, looked at the problems. Like I worked almost two years in the villages to understand what the challenges are and then do the right kind of development to address the challenges. So my R&D followed the demand you know, assessment first. What is the need in the village? What is the demand? How can I solve that demand? Or how can I address the challenge through research, through technology? And that is how our solutions have been developed. We are also working constantly with researchers. So I am working with a couple of engineering colleges in India, two big universities in US, and the whole, the entire R&D is focused around what Sun Moksha is trying to do. What Sun Moksha is, or what my, you know, our role is in the society. So we are the living lab. We bring the reality perspective, and these researchers go and define problems and find algorithms, solve the challenges, and help us so that we finally go back and implement. Yeah. So it is both ways. It is that, you know, there are certain things I cannot do, so I need help. And people are there, our researchers are there out to help. And there are some things that researchers cannot do that we can do. So we bring the data, we do the implementation, we test it out, we give feedback. So we be, we provide them the real-time data to make sure that the R&D is in the right direction. While said that, I would also say that in my view, entrepreneurship is not only the big entrepreneurs. I believe a micro entrepreneurship is equally important. When I go into the villages, we enable a certain people and they become micro entrepreneurs. They start small businesses. They start to do some things. And so I, we are basically trying to create millions of micropreneurs rather than a few large entrepreneurs, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that is the whole difference that our goal has been that I sh- there should be hundreds and thousands and you know la- millions of such small entrepreneurs who will be self-sufficient in their villages, who will be earning their own money, who will be earning the livelihood and re- up improving the economy of the village and of their communities. So we work on both uh, levels of entrepreneurship. Yes, and every okay. R&D is required. Yes. Yes, they go hand in hand. You know, the research, the entrepreneurship, as both of you said, it's not just, you know, we're not just fighting for a big tech company to come in and, and solve our problems. It's enabling the people within the villages or just outside the villages or, you know, people coming in to really action that research, like um, you both were talking about, um, which is, and, and really working with the communities. And, and you both said this, you know, it's not, Oh, I thought of this idea over here and now I'm going to bring this in and it's going to, you know, work. It's actually building that, working out what's happening, what's, what's the wants, the desires, how will this actually work? So I think that's really important. Now we are talking a little bit about research or a lot about research. So I want to look down a bit to just talking about interdisciplinary research. So, you know, we've got, and you're both talking about again, but, you know, we can't solve all the problems as one person, even though maybe sometimes I think that I can solve all the world's problems. But we need to work together with different people, different industries. So, Lara, why is interdisciplinary research so important in this area of smart communities and how can it best be achieved? So in this kind of work, we're, we're working very much at, in the real world. So the real world happens to be that rural village. 
and the real world doesn't <laughs> doesn't work in silos. I mean, none of us live in silos, and everything that we do is affected by the ecosystem in which we we live. So, if you want to effectively impact an ecosystem, then you need to have experts or people in disciplines who understand those different parts of the ecosystem and how they all fit together. So there's no point in putting in, you know, the, a, a toilet if if the things around the toilet are not working, because then that that intervention just doesn't doesn't really work. And so if you want to impact the real world, then you need to acknowledge that it's important to have engineers and also all different kinds of engineers. You need your electronic engineer and your mechanical engineer. So there's interdisciplinarity within sort of engineering or science. But then it's really, really important to have the people people, so the social scientists, involved right from the beginning in the discussion because the clever technology isn't going to change anything. It's the people using the clever technology that's going to change something. And so if, if you're not interacting with and understanding the people and you don't have the disciplinary expertise and the will to do that, it's really just not going to work. So that's disciplines within a university. But then there's this term transdisciplinarity or I use the words intersectoral. So between different sectors, public, private, third sector. And those two things basically mean the same. So you need the, the researchers and you need the implementation people, the practitioners, whether that's people like Ashok and, and his company who are working as a company, but also as development practitioners. So there's intersectoral stuff going on within one organization, which is really very really interesting. But for people working elsewhere who don't have someone like Ashok to work with, you probably will need to work you as the engineer or the researcher will need to work with NGOs on the ground and very importantly with government on the ground. So that if you don't have those, the commitment to working with people and all the technical and disciplinary expertise that's required to do that, unlikely that it's going to work out. Mm. So it's not really a, it's not really a choice. I yeah. don't think one yeah. success project. Yeah. Yeah, for a successful project. Um, I'm just going to take liberties here, and I really wanted to ask you this, but what are the biggest mistakes that engineers often make when approaching these projects? I think the, the biggest mistake is assuming that you can solve it just with the technical solution. So the engineer brings the key, the, the opportunity to solving the problem, but if you don't understand the people involved and what they want, what they desire, what the constraints they face are, and work that as a design constraint into your engineering, you're probably not going to make the right thing. And then your end users or end beneficiaries or whatever you want to call the people you're working with just won't use it. And that means it will fail. So I think the main thing is the technology itself without full and equal acknowledgement of people just probably isn't going to work. Mm. Mm. I mean, the thing is that the real world, the commercial world knows this, right? How much money do, do big companies spend on market research and changing the design of the widgets that it's more attractive? It's the habit of international development that when people over there are paying and people over there are receiving and someone else is delivering in the middle, it's very easy to deliver something that the end beneficiaries don't actually want. In a market economy, then they just won't buy it and it will be a failure. So it's much clearer that you can't, you just, well, you can do it, but you'll be wasting lots of money if you do. So I think this, this little triangle in which we've got science and technology and engineering and entrepreneurship and development and governments all talking together to make sure that what's in invented really is going to be used, mm. then I think we'll have less big flashy failures. Mm. It's um, sustainability in the long term, right? Like it's, you know, sustainability in the true sense of the word. It's, uh, And I think we can 
lose focus on that. I mean, when you say it out loud, it seems obvious, right, that someone has to use the thing at the end of the day. But when you're so fo- you, you, you can really get focused in, oh, but this is such a good thing. Why? Yeah, of course people will use it. But, you know, if it takes them longer to cook or take, you know, they have to walk to the toilet or whatever, whatever it is, if they don't see or value in it. Culturally desirable. Like, I don't like yep. the taste of that. Yep. And I should, we're talking about a bit about sustainability. And could you tell us a little bit about your theory of the change for smart villages and yeah, your company? As I said in the very early, that my theory of change is anchored in SDG 8, develop, creating, you know, developing communities and socioeconomic development improvement of the community is what makes things change. So in our villages, what we do, we focus, the focus is on eight, but then there are anchors, there are enablers. So sustainable energy, water, you know, sustainable food production, these form the basis of my interventions. All of these are anchored into the people, planet, and profit, uh, you know, balance, tr- sustainability triangle. So everywhere we must take care of the S3 SDGs 13, 14, and 15. Climate change, life on water, life on land. It has to be balanced. In fact, I have multiple examples to show you how we had to do uh, a balancing act and you know, do something else in order to within the sustainability triangle. Right? Then we also believe local partnership. SDG 17 is very, very local as well as global. Because if I don't have a local partnership with the community, if I don't have the global partnership with the universities, I will not be able to meet the goals that I have set. So that is a platform cutting across. So once I do eight, then it takes care of one, two, three, four, five, and 10. So eventually, Equality comes in the society, gender equality comes in the society. Of course, hunger, poverty, education, health, all of that can be taken care of if people are economically empowered. And in the long run, as I said, it's generational. In the long run, we end up developing or creating SDG 11, which is the sustainable community. Sustainable community comes over generation, you know, over many, many iterations. It's not that I go intervene today and tomorrow I have a sustainable community. No way. I don't think we can get that. So that comes over years. That comes over maybe generations. And that eventually leads to, you know, SDG, uh, the ultimate SDG of peace and justice on the society uh, in the earth, right? So that is that is how we view it. And this is a repetitive cycle. You know, you go do some intervention, there will be some development, you come back and you do next type of next intervention. Then you come back and you do next intervention. So the in the interventions and the development cycle continues. It's not that it's a one-way process, it's an iterative process. You need to understand what is the next the community is going to require. I'll give you you know a Concrete example, we put the energy there. They say, now I need to go do irrigation. They started doing irrigation. They started producing more. Now they say, hey, we are producing enough. Can we get cold storage? So now it's time to go and intervene with a cold room or a cold you know, storage system so that their produce gets more value. Next step comes, he said, you know, why am I selling raw vegetables? I can process it and sell it. Those are the ideas that we give them. So you add value to them produce. So, and, and that eventually leads to creating of microeconomic zones. So this is a stepwise process which we go, so we don't go and engage with the community and leave. We are always engaged. That is the entire process that we have to follow if we really want long-term sustainable development. Mm. And I mean, you've answered this really already, but how do you ensure that I guess these projects remain sustainable. I guess you, know, you you keep, like you just said there, it's not, oh, we go in, we engage, we give them something, we leave. It's you're continually checking in, like updating, uh, you know, need something else, they want something else. How long do you stay with these villages for? Is it Or is it an indefinite process? No, I think uh, a decade is enough. Over a couple of years, 
you will eventually get them to a level that now you are not needed. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that it may always be needing us is this, uh, you know, maintaining and supporting these technologies. Right? They still have to get some support. They, you know, to keep the technologies working there, and that is where the, you know, that is where it's a it's a service model. It's really not a product model that we are talking about. And most of the time you will see, hey, I have developed a microgrid box. What do I do? The whole game, the whole end aim is that I go and sell this microgrid box to someone and they are on their own, but they cannot. So for us, microgrid box is not the solution. It's the microgrid around it, the entire transmission, distribution, you know, looking at the demand, understanding that their demand may change. How do I make my system so that changing demands can be still be met? So these are the components that go into developing a sustainable solutions and sustainable communities. Well, we're going to wrap up soon. Um, it's been so great to speak with you both. Time has flown, as it always does when you're having a great conversation. Uh, I'll just finish off with a question each um, and yeah, if you want to do a, a short tweetable answer and then we'll wrap up. So first to you, Lara, your phrase inclusive innovation in your work, can you give us a quick definition of that? So our byline is innovation for, with and by the rising billions. And so the, the four is the innovation needs to be totally appropriate for those contexts. The with is we're not going to get it right unless we co-create with people in those contexts and shape the the opportunity of the new engineering to really fit what's need, needed. And eventually by, well, people are innovating themselves in those villages. They are already, there's the term frugal innovation, but they are already innovating. But can we bring the new technology so that they can start to integrate the opportunities of that new technology into their own innovations? And the rising billions, well, the, the bottom half of the world's population that lives under less than $4 a day, their income is increasing. We would like that to go up. And we, we think that's where the exciting, really exciting things can happen. That wasn't very tweetable, but that's what it's all. It's, it's all within the byline. For, with, and by the rising billions. Love it. And a short, to finish off, I'm just going to take some liberties here. And I'm keen to hear your thoughts about, you know, some advice you could give young engineers wanting to get into this space. How do they start? How do they start? I think it all starts with the heart. Do you have your heart there? You know, do you have the compassion? Do you have the empathy for the world? And I have seen that the more and more the young engineers are choosing the route and the route of choosing the path of uh, community and sustainable development. They are more, more empathetic to how the world should look like. In fact, I, I'm really very, uh, you know, hopeful and very, very enthusiastic about future. Because unlike our generation, this new generation is going to be really understanding the world challenges. They, they really know what needs to be done. And they are not stuck up in the, you know, in the wealth building uh, era that we have gone through. Uh, they, are, they care for the society. They care for the nature. They, and so I would say that, you know, the young engineers are already on the right path. And... Uh, Engineering, science, and technology must be used for humanities. And nothing has been more evident than the last one year with COVID. If you look at it, the only winner in this entire you know, ordeal has been the science and technology. Eventually, science and technology is the one which has come to help, which has come to rescue the entire population and the world and over the last you know when have we seen such a rapid effort and r d in science and technology working to get develop the vaccine rarely right this is one of the major feats and what is encouraging is that it's no not one person's uh, territory 
Now there are seven, eight vaccines all across the world coming from India, right? So everywhere, science and technology has brought everybody at an equal footing. That we are all equal. We science is something that is for the humanities, and it should be used for the humanities, the betterment of the humanities. Mm. Yeah, it, it's. Um, I think changing that narrative of you know engineers, science, math, you know the people in that space, all the people in in this space, change the world, and, and we need more of them. Um, so jump on board. We would love to have you. I'm also an engineer. Okay, we're, we're wrapping up. It's been so great to chat with you both. I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I really look forward to talking to you all soon. Um, but we'll say goodbye for now. Thank, Thank you so you. much. It has Thank been a pleasure. Bye. 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 The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're looking for support in podcast strategy and production, workshop design and facilitation, or communication and media advisory, get in touch. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.